We are coming to the close of book five, the book of love. The longest canto, canto three, shows the meeting of Savitri and Satyavan and uh, an exchange between them. So they have met in the forest, they've recognized each other, fallen in love, committed to each other. And last week we, we read the description of that symbolic marriage there in the forest under the eyes of the sun. The sun is their witness. So now there's just one short little section left to close, to round off this canto and this book. So I will just read those few lines, we'll look at them, and then we should have time to make a start on the next book, book six. Then down the narrow path where their lives had met, he led and showed to her her future world, love's refuge and corner of happy solitude. At the path's end, through a green cleft in the trees, she saw a clustering line of hermit roofs and looked now first on her heart's future home, the thatch that covered the life of Satyavan. <clears throat> Adorned with creepers and red climbing flowers, it seemed a sylvan beauty in her dreams, slumbering with brown body and tumbled hair in her chamber in violet of emerald peace. Around it stretched the forest's anchorite mood, lost in the depths of its own solitude. Then, moved by the deep joy she could not speak, a little depth of it quivering in her words, her happy voice cried out to Satyavan, My heart will stay here on this forest verge and close to this thatched roof while I am far. Now of more wandering it has no need. But I must haste back to my father's house, which soon will lose one loved, accustomed tread, and listen in vain for a once cherished voice. For soon I shall return, nor ever again oneness must sever its recovered bliss or fate sunder our lives while life is ours. Once more she mounted on the carven car and under the ardor of a fiery noon less bright than the splendor of her thoughts and dreams. 
she sped swift reined, swift hearted, but still saw in still lucidities of sight's inner world. Through the cool scented woods, luxurious gloom, on shadowy paths between great rugged trunks, pace towards a tranquil clearing, Satyavan. A nave of trees enshrined the hermit thatch, the new deep covert of her felicity, preferred to heaven her soul's temple and home. <coughs> this now remained with her, her heart's constant scene. You will start, Rosa? Yeah. <coughs> then down the narrow path, left near the lights <coughs> had been made, he led and showed to her her, her future wall, love's re refuge and corner of happy solitude. <coughs> Can you can you read her world? Her world. It's the same sound. Her world. Her world. It's world. the same same sound as in world. her. Yeah. Yeah. Her world. Same sound. Yeah. <laughs> So Satyavan, he led Savitri down this narrow path where their lives have met, have come together. And he's leading her down the path to show to her the place that will be her world in the future. No? And Sri Aurobindo says that place is a refuge, a safe place for love and a, a corner of happy solitude. Solitude is when you are alone. This is not a place in a, in a big uh, city or in a palace. Here they will be almost alone. Solitude, isolated in the forest. But they are very happy to be in that world together. Mm -hmm. Dana Lakshmi. At the past, he was planting the trees. She saw a clustering line of hermit roofs and looked now first on her heart's future home, the thatch that covered the life of Sadi. Hmm. So at the path's end, at the end of the path, through a green cleft in the trees. A cleft is a gap, as if something has been cut. Sometimes we see a cleft in rock as a kind of crack. No? Here it is, everywhere are trees. There's a small opening, narrow opening in the trees. And through that narrow opening, she can see a line of roofs, of huts. Hmm? Hermit roofs. There, the hermits, the people who've come away from the city to live in the forest in order to be able to uh, prepare themselves to leave the body or to unite with the divine, they've come there. Hmm? A clustering line. So there's not just one little hut where um, Satyavan and his family are living. There's a few. They are gathering together. Hmm? So she saw that clustering line 
of hermit roofs and looks for the first time on the, the place that will be in future the home of her heart. The thatch, he says, that covered the life of Satyavan. So thatch, here in um, Tamil Nadu we call it keet, mm -hmm. you know? And in the early days of uh, uh, Oroville, many of us lived in keet huts. And in those simple keet huts, uh, often the roof comes almost down to the ground, you know? And then plants grow up, I remember our first huts in, in Grace, they were like that, they had creepers growing up, just like this, you know? but there's the thatch. Uh, it's described in the next sentence, the, the thatch roof, brown, crouched low to the ground. Uh, you read, Nina? Hmm? The Hmm. So this uh, this thatch under which Satyavan lives, it is adorned, it is decorated. Mm -mm. Uh, sometimes we put on jewelry for marriage, you know, adornments. Here the only adornments are these creeping plants which have, uh, have lovely leaves and red flowers, hmm? climbing flowers. So that thatch looks almost like a girl, a girl who lives in the forest sleeping there. A sylvan beauty. Sylvan is an adjective meaning having to do with trees, with the, with the forest. Hmm? So, a girl who lives there in the woods and she's lying down on the ground with her brown body, the thatch is brown, no? and uh, her hair is kind of uh, um, not combed nicely, it's tumbled. Hmm? There she is in her chamber, her bedroom, her private room of emerald peace, green, uh, perfectly protected, inviolate. Uh, nobody goes there. It's a pr her own private room. Well, he's bringing together two ideas, no? One is the peace of the forest, and the other is the color of the forest, the, the emerald color. Hmm. And it stretched the forest and the right moon, launched in the depths of its own solitude. Hmm. So around that, uh, that hut, around that chamber where the, the sylvan beauty is sleeping, stretches, extends, spreads out the forest. And this forest has a special kind of peace in it, a kind of concentration, an anchorite. It's another word for a hermit, for somebody who has gone away from the world and is uh, living in concentration on the divine. So there seems to be a mood like that. Hmm? And uh, this, the, the forest uh, is in that mood of being lost, absorbed, indrawn in the depths of its own solitude. Here again comes that word. It's loneliness, it's aloneness. Hmm? Uh, Edita, would you read? Then, moved by the deep joy, she could not speak. A little depth of it quivering in her words. Her happy voice cried out to Satyavan. Mm, thank you, we'll pause there. Mm -hmm. 
So what is moved? When we feel emotion, no? we say, oh, I'm so moved. And here that emotion is showing in her voice. It's her voice is moved by that deep joy which she can't put into words. No? But some little uh, depth of that deep joy is quivering, is moving, it's making a little a shaking perhaps in the voice. No? So it's her happy voice cried out to Satyavan. So what does she say to him? You'll read, sir? Please. My heart will stay here on its father's ledge. I close to this touched roof when I fall. Now I'm more wandering in that lonely. Mm, thank you. So she says, I have to go, no? but my heart will stay here on the edge of the forest. The verge is the edge, the margin, the borderline. Mm -hmm. And my heart will stay here close to this thatched roof, which is your home. No? While I'm far away, my body's far away, my heart will be here where you are. But she says, my heart doesn't need to wander physically here and there anymore. Before she was on her search, on her quest, she had to travel from one place to another. But now it doesn't need to do that anymore. It has no need of more wandering. It is her heart. No? Yes. Ganga Lakshmi? The tumors head back to my father's house, which soon we lose one love like a stunned tree, and listen in vain for one's cherished voice. Mm. I must haste, hurry, I must hurry back. We uh, hasten you know, to hurry up. I, very quickly she will go back to her father's house. And that house, that palace of her father, will soon be losing one, one accustomed tread. The tread, the sound of your feet. Mm -hmm. So that house will be missing uh, one of the, the feet that it is used to, accustomed, when you are very used to something. Mm -hmm. it, uh, She's been very much loved in that house. And not only the people there, but maybe the house itself uh, loved to feel or hear her tread. And um, the sound of her voice will not be heard there anymore. People will listen in vain for a once cherished voice. Cherished, a voice that you, you value very much, you, you love it and you love to hear it. Well, it was like that once, now her voice will not be heard in that place. Uh, Joel. For soon I shall return, nor ever again oneness must sever its recovered bliss. Our fate sunder our lives while life is ours. Hmm. <clears throat> so she says the, the palace will lose her accustomed tread and her cherished voice because soon I shall be returning here. Hmm. I'll be coming back to this place. And then we will be together in our oneness. And we will not have to separate. To sever means to divide or cut. So that oneness, that oneness of our two lives will not have to be separated again. It will not have to uh, suffer any um, cut in this bliss that we have found now at meeting each other. She says recovered. It refers to that feeling that they both have 
that they have known this bliss of oneness before in other lives. Now they have come together and re-found, rediscovered that bliss of being together. Now there's a brief separation, but she will come back and they won't have to be separated again. And sunder means the same as sever, cutting, separating. Fate will not have to separate our lives as long as life is ours. Yes, nor means and not. So, and oneness will not ever again have to separate this recovered bliss. We wouldn't use the language like this in speech or in ordinary writing, but it's very useful for the poet when he is um, uh, trying to keep a beautiful rhythm to have these short words that say a lot. No? So he, here he does it with this nor, nor and must. This will never again have to separate. Hmm? Alexei. Once more, she mounted from the cavern car and under the order of a fire moon, this bright with the splendor of her thoughts and dreams. She stayed swift rain, swift heart, but still saw and still the cities of sight's inner world. Through the cool, <coughs> scented woods, the cherries bloom, on shadowy paths between great rock trunks, east towards a tranquil, clearing such a one. Mm, so it's a long sentence and a, quite a complicated one. Let's look at it closely. <coughs> so she, she, this car, this chariot that she's driving, it seems to be quite high, no? She gets onto it, climbs up, mounted onto this car, which is so beautifully carved and decorated. Hmm? And under the ardor, the heat and energy of a fiery noon, the hottest time, the middle of the day, but he says that fiery noon, that fiery Indian noon when she goes away is less bright than the splendor of her thoughts and dreams. Her inner state is even more fiery and brilliant than the, the, the day. And she sped, she traveled quickly to speed. Swift reined, so the reins are this uh, leather straps that we use to control the horse. So she's holding the horse, the, the reins, and she's urging the horses to move quickly. And her heart is moving quickly. She quickly wants to go home and quickly come back. No? Yeah. But inwardly, she still can see, she's still seeing in still lucidities of sight's inner world, in the inner sight. There it is silent, it is full of light. She's seeing Satyavan. She's seeing Satyavan pacing, walking towards that tranquil clearing, that peaceful opening in the forest where his home is. Hmm? She, that's how she sees him in her inner sight. Hmm? She sees him pacing, walking through the wood, the cool scented wood. There's that lovely fragrance 
and coolness of the forest and it has this luxurious gloom it is shadowy, full of shadows and there's a kind of richness pleasantness there that's very comfortable he's walking on shadowy paths between great rugged trunks the trunks of the trees uh, that are rough textured, rugged they're not smooth they have uh, rough bark mm -hmm. so that's what she in, in line 437 she still saw what did she see? she saw Satyavan no? pace towards a tranquil clearing through the cool scented woods luxurious gloom on shadowy paths between great rugged trunks. Exuding <coughs> gloom. And then the gloom is the negative air. Yes, but when we speak about the gloom of the forest, it's not always negative. It can be very pleasant, especially in India, to be in the shade of those trees, not out in the bright sunlight. No? And there's something, all the richness of nature is there. That's why he uses this suggestive word, luxurious. It's not luxurious in the sense of the palace with golden uh, things and tapestries and cushions and so on. There's a different kind of luxury in the forest. Hmm? Mahaningham. The name of trees enshrined the hermit that the new deep cover of her felicity preferred to govern her soul's temple and home. These now remain in the, her heart's constant theme. Hmm. A knave of trees. The knave is the central part of a church. And usually there are columns. Hmm? It comes from the Latin word for a ship. It's actually built like the ribs of the church, like a ship. But they are columns. And at a certain time in European architecture, they made those columns consciously like trees. And then the branches arching over when they got high up. No? So here he says the, the trees form like a nave, a passageway, no? enshrining, as if that's a sacred place where Satyavan lives. No? Like, like a church. So that place, that hermit thatch, that brown roof covered with creepers, this is now the deep covert, the secret place of her felicity, of her happiness. This is her soul's temple and home. She prefers this thatched roof in the forest to heaven. She chooses this place hmm, because this is the home of her soul. This is the temple where her, her soul and her love are kept sacred. So this is what she's remembering and seeing in her inner sight. This now remained with her, this scene, Satyavan walking towards that tranquil clearing that through the trees. Hmm? This now remained with her. This is the constant scene of her heart. The other things, the road that she's traveling, she's hardly seeing that at all. Hmm? She's concentrating on this little glimpse that she's had 
of the home of Satyavan, which will be her own home in future. Then down the narrow path where their lives had met, he led and showed to her her future world, love's refuge and corner of happy solitude. At the path's end, through a green cleft in the trees, she saw a clustering line of hermit roofs and looked now first on her heart's future home, the thatch that covered the life of Satyavan. Adorned with creepers and red climbing flowers, it seemed a sylvan beauty in her dreams, slumbering with brown body and tumbled hair in her chamber in violet of emerald peace. Around it stretched the forest's anchorite mood, lost in the depths of its own solitude. Then, moved by the deep joy she could not speak, a little depth of it quivering in her words, her happy voice cried out to Satyavan, My heart will stay here on this forest verge and close to this thatched roof while I am far. Now of more wandering it has no need. But I must haste back to my father's house, which soon will lose one loved accustomed tread and listen in vain for a once cherished voice. For soon I shall return, nor ever again Oneness must sever its recovered bliss, or fate sunder our lives while life is ours. Once more she mounted on the carven car, and under the ardour of a fiery noon, less bright than the splendour of her thoughts and dreams. She sped swift-reined, swift-hearted, but still saw in still lucidities of sight's inner world through the cool scented woods' luxurious gloom on shadowy paths between great rugged trunks, pace towards a tranquil clearing, Satyavan. A nave of trees enshrined the hermit thatch, the new deep covert of her felicity, preferred to heaven her soul's temple and home. This now remained with her, her heart's constant scene. Book six is called The Book of Fate and it has two cantos, The Word of Fate and The Problem of Pain. And this second canto, The Problem of Pain, is um, the last part of Savitri that Sri was working on. 
before he passed away in 1950. So it's to, that is to say, right in the middle of the poem, there's this late addition, which uh, is only loosely connected with the original legend, but which is a very, very important section of the, of the poem because it answers many of our, the, the questions that we have, our anguished human hearts have about suffering. Hmm? That's in the second canto. But first, we follow the story. So far we've seen that there was always a link when we finished one um, canto and start a new one, there's a connection. When we finish one book and start a new one, Shobindo usually makes a link. Here we don't have that. Hmm? The link is in the story because everybody who knows this story knows that when uh, Savitri returns to her father's palace, she meets there Narad, who is a, a, a figure of these Indian traditional stories. He appears in many stories, not only this one. And his characteristic is that although he's like a human being, and he's a devotee of Lord Vishnu, he can travel freely between our world and the higher worlds. And on this occasion, he's coming down from the heavens, Vishnu's heavens, he's coming down to the earth to visit King Asvapati. So that's, that's how the first section begins. And he's a musician, he sings. <coughs> so in this first section of uh, uh, Canto 1 of Book 6, Sri Aurobindo describes the journey that uh, Narad makes coming into the material worlds from the subtle planes and the songs that he sings on the way. So I'll just read a few lines from that. <coughs> In silent bounds bordering the mortal's plain, crossing a wide expanse of brilliant peace. Narad, the heavenly sage from paradise, came chanting through the large and lustrous air. Attracted by the golden summer earth that lay beneath him, like a glowing bowl tilted upon a table of the gods, turning as if moved round by an unseen hand to catch the warmth and blaze of a small sun. He passed from the immortal's happy paths to a world of toil and quest and grief and hope. To these rooms of the seesaw game of death with life. Across an intangible border of soul space, he passed from mind into material things amid the inventions of the inconscient self and the workings of a blind somnambulist force. So 
So shall we have a look at some of these lines? Would you like to read? <coughs> Thank you. Bounds are like boundaries, no? There are silent boundaries on the edge of this plane, this material plane where we beings who are subject to death, we mortal beings live. No? So he comes crossing a wide expanse of brilliant peace, peace and lots of light. No? Narad, he's the heavenly sage, he's coming from paradise and he comes chanting, he's singing as he comes. He's passing through this large air, lustrous air. It again means full of light, shining air. Yes. At the back, the very back. The trip that lies a golden summer earth that lay beneath him like a glowing bowl tiled upon the table of the gods, turning as it moved around by an unseen hand to catch the warmth and place of a small sun. He passed from the immortal's happy paths to a world of toil and quest and grief and hope, to these rooms of the sea so jane of death with life. Hmm, yes. So he's attracted, he sees the the summer earth, the earth in the summer season, golden, shining golden, and it's, he, Sri Aurobindo describes it like a golden bowl hmm, that's been tilted. So this is a lovely picture we, we have in a few places in the poem, Sri Aurobindo looking at the world from far out in space. Hmm? It's turning around as if it's being moved by an unseen hand and it's being turned so that it catches the warmth and blaze of our sun. Small sun. And they're out in the universe there are many much bigger suns than our sun. So he's attracted by this beautiful earth summer earth. So he passes out of the immortal's happy paths into the mortal's plane. He crosses that boundary. No? He comes into this world, this world of toil. We always have to work and work hard and we always have to seek and so we suffer, we feel grief, and we feel hope. These are the characteristics <coughs> of the mortal's plane. Hmm? To these rooms, these rooms where we live, where there's always a game going on, a seesaw game. A seesaw is uh, um, something that we have in children's playgrounds. There's a fulcrum and a plank with seats and the children go up and down. Now one is up and the other is down and then it's changing. This is a seesaw. So here in our world it's life and death always joined, alternating. One is dominating, the other is dominating. Exchanging positions. Uh, you'll read now? Would you read? Of 
somnambulist. Hmm. So he crosses over this borderline, the borderline between the immortal's paths and the mortal's plane. He moves across that border. That is an intangible border. You can't exactly feel it. Hmm? It's a border in soul space, in consciousness space. So he's passing from the worlds of mind into the world of matter. And here material things uh, exist in the surrounded by the inventions, the things that have been invented, created by the inconscient self, not the supreme self, but the inconscient, things that have emerged in the process of evolution. And the, here in our world we live amid the workings of a blind somnambulist force, the energy that works here the energy that works in matter, that works in life and mind, is as if sleepwalking. A somnambulist is somebody who moves about while they are asleep. It's a very amazing thing that somnambulists um, seem to be able to move about, although they are unconscious, they don't make mistakes, they seem to know exactly where they are going and to find their way and it's very, very dangerous to wake them up because then they may make a wrong movement. No? So Sri Aurobindo is suggesting that this apparently inconscient energy which is driving our world, um, it's as if it's asleep and yet still it knows exactly what to do. In silent bounds bordering the mortal's plain, crossing a wide expanse of brilliant peace, Narad, the heavenly sage from paradise, came chanting through the large and lustrous air. Attracted by the golden summer earth that lay beneath him like a glowing bowl tilted upon a table of the gods, turning as if moved round by an unseen hand, to catch the warmth and blaze of a small sun. He passed from the immortal's happy paths to a world of toil and quest and grief and hope, to these rooms of the seesaw game of death with life. Across an intangible border of soul space, he passed from mind into material things, amid the inventions of the inconscient self and the workings of a blind somnambulist force.